long story to tell us about the CHC crisis. So please join me, me in welcoming Dr. Hamza. Well, I'm so honored to come to the university that my twin boys will be starting next uh, semester. Uh, they got accepted to pre-med, and the other one will probably do engineering. So, very happy to be here. And this is where I graduated. I did my residency at the Health Sciences Center. Um, well, I think to talk about the Syrian crisis in uh, 30 to 40 minutes is not going to be enough time. But I'll try to do my best to you know, touch about a little bit about history of Syria, history of the conflict, and then what has happened in Syria over the last uh, four years. Well, Syria is really a small country. It's uh, in the heart of the Middle East. It borders Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and also has some uh, border on the Mediterranean. Syria is very well known to be diverse in uh, ge geographically, ethnically, and also religiously. Like to the west of Syria, we have the beautiful ever green mountain that slopes down to the Mediterranean beach. And then we have the fertile, uh, fertile uh, plains in the middle. And to, to the east and southeast, the Syrian desert. There are many ethnic groups in Syria. There are the Arabs, there are the Kurds, there are the um, uh, Assyrians, Armenians, Greek, and even some Turks. And there are also different, different religions, like uh, Islam, uh, Alawi, uh, Christian, uh, Druze, and Yazidis, too. The population of Syria before the crisis was estimated to be 23 to 24 million. Most of the people are concentrated in big cities like Damascus, Aleppo, mostly to the west, and some cities around the Euphrates. Syria is very, is very well known to be, to have the oldest cities in the world, like Aleppo is known to be the oldest city ever on earth, that's what they uh, claim. And Damascus is uh, the oldest capital. Uh, some of the oldest remains were discovered in Syria actually, dating back to 200 to 40,000 BC. Many, many civilizations have come and gone through Syria like Amorites, Arameans, Phoenicians, Palmyrans, uh, Romans, Muslims, Ottomans, and French Mandate. And finally, Syria has gained its independence in, on April 17, 1946. Some of the remains that were discovered, uh, like this is from 5000 BC. Uh, some Arameans remains from 700 BC. And by the way, there's a city, a small city in the south of Syria that they still speak this, uh, the language Ar Aramaic, the language of Jesus. And the, the city's name is Malula. Some of the remains of the Assyrian warship stone uh, shows like their accomplishment back then. Uh, some Romans remains, Palmyra, very famous. This was the only working water wheel in the world from the Roman era too. And this is in the city of Hama. This is Church St. Simon in the province of Aleppo. It's like uh, almost 20, 30 minutes away from the city center of Aleppo. <laughs> This is the Great Mosque of Aleppo. It's also called uh, Masjid al-Amawi. Uh, almost 1,300 years old. And you can see in the background the biggest castle in the world, uh, Aleppo Citadel. Uh, again, Aleppo Citadel. This is what a typical house in the uh, around 1800, 1700, 1900 uh, year uh, during the Ottoman period would look like. The house would be around a courtyard that typically would have like orange trees, jasmine trees, and some uh, other you know plants. Uh, 
this is again the uh, courtyard of that great mosque in Aleppo. This was built in like uh, around 1800 something in Aleppo. People coexisted in Syria for many, many, many years. And you can see here, like in my city, Aleppo, this is a mosque. It's sandwiched between two churches. Uh, you can see it from the background. There's another one on the other side. This castle was built during the Crusaders' years, uh, close to Homs. This is what all bazaars, uh, bazaar street would look like in Aleppo. And by the way, the bazaar in Aleppo was the longest and the oldest one in, uh, the, in the Middle East. Even bigger than the one in Egypt or Turkey. So many of these old streets were transformed to become like a boutique, hotels, and restaurants. It was very vibrant and uh, full of life before the crisis. This is what a typical uh, modern uh, street in uh, Syria would look like. Damascus in 1950s, it has a very famous uh, river that goes through it, Barada. And uh, somewhere around here, there's the Qasim Mountain. This is the central park in the, my city, Aleppo. Uh, was built during the uh, French period. This is what a new street in Aleppo or any Syrian city would look like. So what happened? What, uh, what happened in the last four years? How did we get to this point? Um, March 2011, there were 19 children from the city of Dara, inspired by the Arab Spring in Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt. They sprayed some uh, political graffiti on, the, on their school walls. They got caught by the security forces. They get arrested, they get tortured. When their parents went to get them released, they were humiliated big time. And uh, the city of Dara went on demonstration against uh, these kind of uh, practices. The demonstration was, for, was faced by the security system, and they fired and killed some of the demonstrators and wounded so many others. The other story, the regime would say that, uh, that there were some infiltrators that shot at the demonstrator to incriminate the regime. When the news of the violence and the killing of uh, the people in Dara spread in Syria, other demonstrations started spreading in different cities of Syria. They were confronted again by extreme violence by the regime, by arrest, by torture, and uh, things got uh, out of control. Week after week, Friday after Friday, the people of Syria, they demonstrated against the regime. They were asking for freedom, for dignity, for democracy, and to be faced only by extreme violence and extreme uh, measures by the government. Here's a picture of some of uh, the demonstration in the city of Homs. This is a picture of a peaceful demonstration in the city of Hama. <coughs> These peaceful demonstration, and the regime doesn't call it a peaceful demonstration because he always, the regime always claimed that the, the whole thing was plotted by some external forces like the United States, Qatar, Turkey, or whatever countries to bring down the regime, and this was never done by the regime. All the shooting and the killing was being done by infiltrators from uh, uh, outside forces. This led to some of the army people to refuse to carry their, the orders of their superiors, and eventually led to defection uh, in many units in the army. <coughs> And this Free Syrian Army was formed. And the fighting spread from Dara to Homs to Aleppo, many, many cities. 
as the fighting intensified, and initially was like just like a firearms, and immediately intensified to involve heavy military incursions into the cities, and heavy use of cannons, rockets, tanks, and eventually even fighter jets, Scott missiles, which is surface-to-surface -surface ballistic missiles against civilian areas. And lastly was the chemical attack on the city and the uh, suburb of Damascus. As Syria descended into chaos, this became a very good place for extremists from all over the world to come and infiltrate Syria, such as Al-Qaeda, ISIS, <coughs> and even uh, external forces from Iran and Hezbollah from Lebanon. So what started out people wanting to demonstrate for democracy changed to uh, an internal conflict and later on became regional conflict and now it has become an international conflict because now we have uh, the United States and other forces trying to get rid of uh, ISIS and has become almost like an international crisis. So what happened during the last four years? What happened to all these civilians, like uh, the people who are not involved on either side, or even if they are involved? This is according to the most recent estimates that, uh, according to the United Nations, that there are four million Syrians registered as refugees in the surrounding countries of Turkey, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and to a less extent Iraq and small numbers in here and there in different European countries. Um, Eight million people are internally displaced in Syria. This is half of the population of Syria They have lost their homes. Either they lost it completely and they had to flee the country to the surrounding countries or they had to flee the city and go live with their relatives or uh, in a smaller town or something like that. According to the most recent, most conservative estimate, there are 250,000 people who have been killed in the last four years. Many, many Syrians are missing. There are one million Syrians injured. Some of them, majority of them, are permanently disabled. And this is really a small number, but I really think it's much higher than that. There are 23,000 23, children have been killed in this crisis. This shows what happened to the city of Homs after uh, some of the, re the rebels, they took control of it and was uh, surrounded by the regime forces and fighting and the siege lasted for many months. This is the result of this fighting between the two forces. This is in the city of Aleppo. This is very common now, like almost half at least half of the city of Aleppo that used to be vibrant, used to be the capital, the industrial capital of Syria, has become completely paralyzed and completely like a ghost city. This is what uh, many streets in Aleppo would look like. This used to be a very vibrant square, and this was like a very old historic hotel in Aleppo, completely uh, destroyed by a, a, like a bomb. Remember the bazaar in Aleppo? Completely burned, completely destroyed. Antiquities in Syria did not survive. Almost the majority of antiquities in the city of Aleppo completely destroyed. This is the great mosque of Aleppo, or the Masjid Amawi, completely destroyed. <coughs> so as the people fled Syria, they but the fighting was like worse in the south of Syria. The majority went to Jordan. And uh, I'm sure you, you all have heard of al -Zatari. When we went to al it was terrifying to see the view, like, uh, like endless you know, tents, like city of tents in the middle of the desert. The whole, the whole country has descended to chaos. All aspects of life have been affected. Uh, one of the worst things that has happened in Syria was like education system. When the people fled within Syria, they used schools as a place to seek shelter. 
and also the military unit did use it as a military base, and some of the and also some of the rebels used it as a place to hide too. Schools were not respected like they are supposed to, according to international law, and they were targeted by many many uh, fighting forces on both both sides. Many teachers have either been killed or fled the country uh, out of fear for their life. And the majority of children for the last four years have not had education at all. And by the way, 50% of the refugees, the four million people that live outside of Syria, they are children under the age of 16. This is one of the schools that was targeted. Another school. Health system completely <coughs> collapsed. Close to 600 people, 600 medical personnel have been killed in the last four years. Early on during the conflict, the regime would arrest any physician who would treat demonstrators. Um, what started out like we used to have 35,000 physicians, right now only 5,000 physicians have stayed in Syria. 65% of Syrian doctors have left the country. Majority of hospitals, unfortunately, just like schools, have been targeted. And almost, it's estimated almost 70% uh, of uh, Syria's, Syria's, uh, Syrian uh, hospitals have been completely destroyed. And close to 90% of ambulances have been completely destroyed. Unfortunately, both sides, they used ambulances as a method of transporting their soldiers and fighters, and that led to not respecting ambulance as a, a sacred uh, method of transporting uh, people, you know, or innocent people are uh, wounded. It became like a, a military equipment. Syria that used to export medicine to the surrounding countries have lost 90% of their pharmacy, the medicine factories, and as a result, that also is uh, a major problem in Syria. I'm sure you all heard also the vaccination and the emergence of polio in Syria for the first time ever in many, many years. This is a university hospital. I studied in this one uh, during my training in Syria. And right, this is really a nice picture because right now it's like completely destroyed. And you can see how there was no respect for uh, medical facilities whatsoever. Basic services are, they don't exist. Whenever I speak to my mom who still lives in Aleppo, she is lucky if she has like water like once a week for a few hours. She's lucky if she gets electricity one hour a day. 80% um, of Syria is completely off the electricity grid. doesn't have uh, electricity anymore. Many cities have no water, and many cities are, especially the one under siege, they don't get enough food, they don't get enough uh, like formula for babies, medication, and so on. And of course, heating fuel has been really difficult to manage since it's being used by the fighting forces to fuel their equipment and also because of lack of production of oil and the capture of many oil facilities by the extremists of ISIS. Of course, with this fighting, transportation of, even if you plant things and you have like uh, agricultural things, you cannot move it from place to place. Starvation has killed many people in Syria. And also, <coughs> the estimates of the 250,000 does not <coughs> count people dying because of starvation, because of complication of their diabetes, or complication of infection, or dehydration, and so on. With the medical care, that doesn't exist anymore. This shows picture of Syria like at night. You can see this is like the city of Aleppo. Almost no electricity. Damascus has lost most of that. And you can see all these areas around the Euphrates completely gone, half of the power. Children really suffered the most. Uh, Early on, as early as in the first uh, few months of the crisis, many children were uh, kidnapped for ransom to finance their fighting. Many children have been killed. Many children have been sexually abused. Many children have been recruited by both sides to fight, which is 
absolutely unacceptable. Children can get arrested in Syria. They can be put in prison. And of course, human shields. Most recently, I was speaking to my uh, relative in Aleppo. She has two children. While they were coming back from school, a uh, 15 and 16 year old, they get stopped with their friends by the security forces to help them fill bags of sand to create um, a security place. Their parents did not know about them until a few hours later. They were able to pay money to get them released. However, the families that could not afford paying money, they lost one of their children. They got uh, killed by a sniper by the rebels. Valerie Amos, she said, every time we use a new figure in relation to the Syrian crisis, we say that's, that's un unprecedented. It really, it's changing every day, it's changing every hour, and I'm certain by the end of 2015, these numbers would not be valid at all. So, in 2013, I, got, I received a phone call from a friend of mine, a Syrian-American physician. He said, he, we talked about the whole thing and we felt like paralyzed. We felt like we ought to do something. We need to help our fellow Syrian citizens and not get caught in the political crisis of uh, the whole uh, problem. We studied the surrounding countries and we felt like uh, going to Iraq or Lebanon is going to be really dangerous for physicians because of the political instability and because of other circumstances. We tried Turkey and we found that the Turkish government is uh, either covering the Syrian refugees and the camps by full-time physicians or the Syrians who live in the small towns and cities of, of Turkey, they can seek medical care for free. So we decided to go to Jordan. This was in 2013 when we, by the way, we're not allowed to take pictures in Jordan, so I was like holding the camera like this. I was able only to take very few pictures, so I'll show some of them. This is in Al Zafir in 2013. We saw children caring for children. It's just like unbelievable. Um, I'm sure this happens even before the crisis, but when you see it time after time after time, you know there's something else going on. It's not just the the crisis. This is tells you that many of them have lost their parents, and that's why. You see children carrying other children. This is the sewer system. And this was in the beginning uh, of uh, building Al Zatari. I'm sure they have better services right now. What we found in Al Zatari that uh, <coughs> the refugees, they had field hospitals from United Arab Emirates, France, uh, Saudi Arabia. So we were able to work in these clinics and help see patients in different specialties. We would go in a group every few months uh, of 50 doctors, humanitarian, social workers, and even psychologists and psychiatrists. We will divide in uh, groups of eight to 10. We will take a van, we will go to different places. At Zateri, we felt like we were so limited because of uh, having the field hospitals and plus uh, the travel time from uh, Man Jordan to uh, the camp was taking some of our time that we could invest in seeing patients. So we, we decided to go to camps, illegal camps, which was really surprising to me. There were so many generous Jordanians, they would give a land to some of these refugees that did not want to stay in al Zatari and also they cannot afford living in the small or big cities in Jordan. So there are many camps scattered throughout Jordan with illegal tents, and these, uh, when we got there, these kids were so excited to see people. We, we would like uh, establish clinics in that camp, and my turn was to sit on the rock and see patients in between tents. We were surprised, the sanitation, uh, of course, it's so difficult to be clean in a camp like that, you know, like, uh, these kids did not just have a mild ear infection or ear infection, or they, when they come to see you, they are really sick. They're having big time pneumonia, their ears are busted and they're bleeding because they have no medication, they have no uh, ability to quite often go see a doctor because of the expensive uh, medical care in Jordan. 
many kids were wandering in the camp barefoot. Then we also um, worked with the um, like Marrakes Reinted Usra, which is like a, a social clinics in uh, Jordan. They would open their centers for, for us. They would announce our coming you know, like, uh, to the Syrian and even Jordanian that we are coming to see patients. And it's like you open the flooding gates. Um, we would see like anywhere from 300 to 500 patients a day. And very often these kids have the same look very pale, very exhausted, very anxious, very fearful, not trusting. And we heard the same issue over and over again. That wedding, 15, 16 year old, all of them are doing it. Almost like 60% of children are doing bedwetting. All of them are having night terror, nightmares, PTSD, violent behavior against even siblings uh, after witnessing and seeing what they have gone through. One story that struck me on that day when I was in this clinic, I saw three siblings. I saw the six-year-old was uh, stabbed in his eye with a pencil by his uh, seven-year-old brother. And when I, you know, like, it took me time to warm, make him warm up to me after questioning and trying to figure out why he did this to his brother, he said, well, I saw that on TV. Or I, you know, like, I heard of this uh, being practiced by so-and-so. So, -and -so. so these kids really have seen things that they are not supposed to see and have heard of stories that they're not supposed to hear. Despite, their, and on the other end too, kids were very resilient. I, we were really encouraged. When we went there, we felt like we are going there to empower these people. We felt the opposite. We felt that these people were really making us feel good because they were, also a good portion of them, they were just dignified, they felt like something positive would happen at the end of this crisis. There is no reason in the 21st century when you point a camera at a child, three to four year old, that he surrenders. This is unacceptable. I'll open it to questions. I felt like I should give more time for a question and answer because it's so hard, to, like I said, to cover a five-year or four or a four-year crisis in uh, 30, 40 minutes. I felt like you might ask me questions. I'm more than open to political history, anything related to Syria. Well, just what would you encourage college students, I mean, like us here at the university? Like, what can we, what should we be doing now? What can we do in the future? Is your first hand? No, we well, some people like uh, they would volunteer their time, and they we have some college students that they came with us. Everybody was needed, like just to hold, you know, like especially like when you are seeing a female uh, patient, like we have some female social workers or female college students. They would be very supportive of, the, of these mothers when because when they melt down, they're telling you their story just to hug these mothers and to you know, like help them with their feelings and talk about it, it was really very, very encouraging. And also, very simple things. When we go to these camps, a pencil, crayon, coloring book, they were just thirsty for any educational material. They just wanted something. Um, we had also, like in the past, we did like a, you know, some drive for clothes and stuff like that in Oklahoma, but we found it to be very expensive to, um, you know, ship it to Jordan uh, or Lebanon or any place like that. Um, I think awareness, you know, too, just to be aware of the crisis and to, I don't think we can, I feel like right now politically, like the right to our senators or president is too late. I think this has become chaotic beyond recognition. I don't think anybody has a solution for the political crisis or the fighting crisis in Syria. But at least human, on a humanitarian basis, we can help so much. And there are many different uh, <coughs> you know, like, uh, groups that can be really helpful. And if anybody is interested, I can hook you up with any. We have like the Syrian American Medical Society. We have, I went with Salam Cultural Museum, which is uh, from Portland. 
Oregon. Um, they are also like National American Medical Society, National Arab American Medical Society. So if anybody is interested to know more about being able to help the Syrian, uh, I'll be more than happy to connect you. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what role the United Nations play is playing, and also um, different UN agencies like UNICEF or the World Health Organization. Um, I'm a historian of public health in Africa, and I work on the WHO, and I was really interested um, in particular um, this problem of uh, polio vaccinations polio, right. getting stopped. And I know the same thing is happening for even with the Ebola epidemic in West Africa, that all of the public health provisions that were in place for other things, measles, um, polio, that kind of stuff, that it's been completely shut down. and so. I know for West Africa, <clears throat> a lot of people are saying even when the Ebola epidemic ends, there's going to be sort of broader public health ramifications, and I see the same thing happening in Pakistan, and it sounds like right. um, in Syria as well. Actually, WHO was heavily involved in the polio crisis. With the WHO and also like a Syrian American Medical Society, the physician of the Syrian American Medical Society were able to distribute polio vaccine to the provinces in the north of Syria. And actually, we have not heard of any new case of polio in the last uh, few months. It was quite a successful story. WHO would uh, bring their supplies to uh, the small towns in Turkey around the Syrian border, and then uh, between different uh, you know, Syrian physicians, they would like uh, almost like smuggle these vaccines in uh, even small, uh, small uh, uh, coolers, and they would go from house to house and town to town to distribute these vaccines and vaccinate these children. That was quite successful in preventing uh, voting. What about the people that are still left in Aleppo? Like I know you said that you still have some family there. Because I know, you know, what I've read about the polio vaccination, the problem with polio vaccination in Pakistan, for example, is that it's really hard in zones with ongoing conflict to administer vaccines. Uh, the government of Syria still provide vaccines okay. to uh, the areas under their control. Okay. So like uh, in Aleppo, where my mom lives under the uh, control of the government, vaccination is still going. However, not as good as it used to be. Okay. Uh, even before the conflict, like some people don't trust, you know, like uh, the government, yeah. just like here. Yeah. But overall, it's not bad, and the vaccination rate is not as bad as in the hot area, like fighting area. Okay. Um, medication is really a major thing. Like my mom has, my mother has like high blood pressure and uh, diabetes. We have to smuggle medicines from Turkey if somebody's traveling from Turkey or somewhere back to Syria, we would send medication enough for a few months. And many people, like I know somebody who has hepatitis C, she, I don't think she will survive. Like she, there's no way, even with the government support, that she will be able to get treatment, very expensive treatment. So um, uh, nobody has done any statistics on this kind of uh, morbidity, you know, like uh, things because of lack of uh, health care in Syria, but uh, I'm certain it's horrible. Thank you very much for your lecture. <coughs> so in terms of medical care for the refugees who have fled Syria comparatively, where do they have it, where is it most severe and difficult, you know, not getting adequate care? Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and then in those places, what are the leading medical conditions among the refugees? Um, definitely when we went to Turkey, we felt helpless because they would not allow us to uh, do much because they have full-time enough uh, physicians in the camps. Outside of the camps, people that uh, are living in small towns and cities, they can go to any government hospital and seek care, and they don't pay a thing. Um, so Turkey was like, we felt like we were, the people that went to Turkey, they had the purpose to go into Syria. The people that did not feel safe to enter Syria, I felt helpless. I couldn't help much at all in Turkey. Uh, Lebanon is, there is a huge demand in Lebanon. Lebanon does not allow building of uh, uh, camps, like uh, refugee camps. So these people are really, they live like in horrible circumstances. We, we felt quite concerned. We sent a team of physicians to evaluate the situation in Lebanon, and we were advised by many people not to come to Lebanon because of security. Jordan, we felt we can help the most, and Jordan is not, the, not a rich country. They really need big support from uh, different countries. This is a job beyond Jordan ability 
this takes multi-billion dollars to care for 1.5 million people in Jordan. Uh, and like I said, in the camp itself, Zaatari, they are covered overall. But the people who are living in the streets, there are people living in the streets in uh, different cities and the surrounding uh, countries, they have no medical care whatsoever. And there are, when we, we went to houses to visit some of these people, we would enter a house like the size of this room, and there would be 50 to 60 people living in it. And, and unfortunately, with lack of education, many of these guys were smoking in this room, and all these kids were having ear infection, asthma attack, and, and no, no ability to pay for inhalers or medication or amoxicillin or anything like that. It's, it's really, really terrifying. The other thing was like the disabled and amputees. I'm not a surgeon, but I went with my, some of my surgeons' friends. It was really unbelievable the number of people that have like no limbs and they need help uh, with like a you know wheelchair or uh, artificial limbs or even a cane or something like that. The number is unbelievable, and I really think one million injured is really very conservative too. Anything else? Um, just a point of clarification. Did you say that you're a pediatrician? Yeah. So you were seeing primarily children yes. during. So I, ha I was wondering, you said so many children had lost parents. Did you have children sometimes coming by themselves to see you? Or who, how did they find out about you? Um, and, and if they came with their parents, I'm just curious about what the parents told you about why they finally decided to come. Never came by themselves. They would be brought by a relative mm -hmm. or a neighbor. And very often, like I'll be seeing a, a child or a baby, I'll say, is this your son? She'll say, no, this is my neighbor's uh, you know, child. They all got killed. And uh, we found her at rebel, you know, like uh, you know, I had to save her and come to join us. So we've seen many stories like that. Um, I did not get involved as much in the social aspect because I was pressured to see medical issues. You know, like uh, I'll see 70, 80, 90 patients a day, and I was like, just wanted to move them, move them. You know, like get uh, this ear infection under control, get this asthma under control, give them samples. And whenever we travel, by the way, to Jordan, each person would take like 200 to 300 pounds worth of medication that we get from. Uh, you know, like from donations, from our own money, and also samples. We get so many samples at the office. Uh, the ones that worked really hard were the psychologists, psychiatrists, surgeons, and social workers. <coughs> the need for these people are, is just beyond imagination. We had a psychiatrist in the 60s of his age, came from Germany. He went almost like three times already right now uh, to Jordan. When he went, came the first time with us to a Zatari camp, after a whole day of counseling people, he broke down. He just fell down on the ground. He started you know, sobbing and crying. And he said, in my 30 year plus practice in psychiatry, I have never seen horrible, I've heard horrible stories like what I have seen today. I know you've been trying to focus so much on the humanitarian side, but the humanitarian side of a crisis is, you know, is, is a significant thing. So, I mean, I don't want to see, do you have any way of, you know, any scenario of trying to end the situation, or at least minimize the losses, if you have, you know, a chance to talk to yeah. Do you have any... I think yeah, at, so at minimum, we, uh, minimum protect the civilians. The civilians should not be a target of fighting by both sides of the fighting. Or actually, I don't know if it's really just two sides anymore. There are many, many sides in Syria now. But when it comes to humanitarian and medical relief, I think they also need to be protected by all forces on the ground, which doesn't happen at all. And then, like, we need to enforce that uh, the neutrality of the medical relief. I don't think it should be politicize or anything like that. We need big financial help for physicians who are on the ground. These 5,000 people in Syria, majority of them are not getting paid to care for their patients. I have a relative who, an orthopedist surgeon, uh, he insists on staying. He is a dual citizen. He is British and Syrian. Uh, his wife and children 
moved to England, he insists on staying in Aleppo and treating these orthopedic cases. He was kidnapped. Uh, he was kidnapped a year and a half ago, and we heard nothing about him for almost two months. And finally, he paid almost half of what he has collected in his life uh, to get freed. Um, you would expect him he would go back to England. He did not. He stayed in Aleppo still. And he insists on, he's not making any income probably, and he would, he used to be rich and he lost all his fortune probably, but we need to help these physicians who, are, who stay behind to care for the Syrian people. Syrian American Medical Society, we, we sponsor almost 150 physicians. Uh, we pay them salaries on a monthly basis to encourage them to stay, whether it's under the control of the rebels or under the control of the government. We, we try to help as many as we can but 150 physicians is nothing. We cannot do this alone. Um, so hopefully, as uh, SAMS, we call it SAMS, Syrian American Medical Society, hopefully as we get, uh, we're getting more and more donations, hopefully we will be able to deliver more and more medical care to our fellow citizens in, uh, inside Syria. Because outside of Syria, like I said, I think governments are taking care of it, and we, try, we can try and go help and build it here and there, but inside of Syria, they need help big time. Do you see an end to the conflict? Do I don't think, I'm very pessimistic. It's completely forgotten. We are just focusing on, like, an, I, as a doctor, when you are, when you have a patient who comes to you with a fever, I'm not gonna just ask, uh, focus on the fever. I'm gonna ask if there are other symptoms. I wanna know what's causing the fever. ISIS is a symptom of a big problem in Syria. And we are just focusing on that symptom, trying to get rid of ISIS, and that's not enough. The conflict has to end. We have to force all these fighting forces to stop and to put an end to the misery of the civilians. And unfortunately, we are not doing much at all. We're just trying to get rid of ISIS, and that's not going to be enough. I mean, it's just going to breed more and more terrorists in Syria. Like, I, if you remember after the chemical attack on a uh, suburb of Damascus, that was like crossing the red line that was established by President Obama. So we moved our Navy, right? And uh, we put really big pressure on the Syrian government. Guess what? They gave up their chemical weapons. <laughs> it doesn't take much to this chaotic situation to stop. If you put enough pressure, I am certain it will stop. But I think that conflict has become a place to solve all the issues of different countries, like Iran is fighting Saudi Arabia and Syria. Sunni are fighting uh, Shia in, uh, in Syria. Uh, Turkey is fighting, I don't know who's there fighting. You know, everybody's fighting. They made Syria a place to fight and just uh, not care for any human uh, suffering at all. And what started out asking for democracy and dignity has ended up with a disaster. Yeah, uh, you were talking about your experience in Jordan, and I was just kind of wondering what the response was from the host country. Say, so was there a lot of uh, involved medical involvement from Jordan within your local medical systems? Or of course, we had many actually, many f uh, physicians from Jordan that got involved whenever they heard that we were coming. We would have some Jordanian physicians or even nurses that would uh, help us. And of course, all these uh, non-profit organizations, Jordanian organizations, they will open their centers for us and they will advertise that we are coming. So they would uh, you know, allow these uh, patients to come in and see us. Uh, the Jordanian government gave us uh, like the authorization to work in uh, Jordan, just like we are working and practicing medicine in, in, uh, in uh, the United States. So our U.S. license works in Jordan just like, uh, like here. And that was really, really great. Initially it was quite hard because uh, we were not authorized. We worked under the table. We would not try to make our self, uh, you know, seen by the uh, Jordanian for, you know, like, uh, uh, police. But uh, quite often many of these clinics were closed uh, early on. But right now everything is legal. We try to work with the Jordanian government. It just takes time, you know, like, uh, to get an authorization and permit to do things like that. 
we have any other questions? Oh, just thank you very much for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you so much.